Billiken fans, we have a, a very special guest for this episode. Uh, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I think we're going to get a lot of great, great stories uh, yes. from, you know, Romar to Soderberg to, you know, Majerus. Uh, he was the head athletic trainer at St. Louis University from 2000 to 2007 and currently is the interim chair of the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics and director of the athletic training program at St. Louis University. It's Anthony Breitbach. Uh, you may not remember the name, but definitely a familiar face around Billiken Athletics for the last, you know, 21 years. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. You know, I, I, I probably, um, not many people probably know my name around athletics, but, but that's the way I like it. I, I really don't, I, I'd really rather help people be successful than, than just, uh, you know, worry about who gets credit for what. So it's pretty awesome stuff. So thanks for this invitation. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know Pete was excited. I was excited when we heard you would be uh, interested in doing, it. I was, I was getting nervous when I, when I text somebody that I don't like, when I get their number from somebody else, I'm like, Oh my God, am I bothering this person? They're going to hate me. I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, but, that's cool. That's all. All's good. But yeah. Um, so you, uh, you, you, did you grow up in Iowa? Cause you went to Iowa, you, the university of Iowa. Yeah. So I grew up in Dubuque, Iowa. I, um, I really, um, when I was, um, in, I was actually, I got a chance to, um, I have one brother who's actually now in St. Louis also, and my parents moved here. So we didn't know anything about St. Louis until I came here. And then once I, once I transitioned over from head athletic trainer to my faculty position, in the Doisy College of Health Sciences, um, my family all decided to kind of move here for one reason or the other. So now our entire family is in St. Louis, which is, which is pretty amazing. So um, yeah, I, I just, you know, I got a chance to go to the University of Iowa from in high school, um, from high school and, and um, got a chance to be an athlete, you know, be a part of the athletic training program there. Um, I get the really, I mean, my freshman year, you know, Iowa had 20 straight losing seasons and we went to the Rose Bowl my freshman year. Gordy Bohannon was our quarterback and his uh, and his kids are pretty good basketball players themselves at Iowa and in Wisconsin and and those types of things like that. So, uh, um, yeah, we it was a pretty magical time to be at Iowa. We had Dr. Tom Davis as one of our basketball coaches and all those types of things like that. So we had a great time there. And then I after that, I went to graduate school at the University of Florida. Um, one of the one of the things they always tell us in athletic training is is go to a different part of the country um, because it, everybody kind of comes from family trees, just like coaching trees, you know. And um, and I got a chance to work with Chris Patrick at the University of Florida. I worked with, worked with a pretty good baseball team. Um, we played everybody. I mean, we you know we played against Robin Ventura in Oklahoma State. We played against uh, Greg Vaughn in Miami. We played against a lot of really good. Um, really good teams. And, um, and then I got to work with football my second year. And we had, um, we had, a, we had, we had, a, we had a very good football team uh, the year before Steve Spurrier came, actually, he, he came the year after I got done. Um, and then I um, moved to Milwaukee for a couple of years and um, with one of our docs from Florida. And I got a chance to go back to my hometown in 1989 to start a clinic. I was the first high school athletic trainer in my high, in my, in my city. Um, which is I've, something I'm very proud of, and and um, and we grew that program, and I and um, I got to work with a Clark University, um, it's Clark College at the time, and I I met a guy named Mark Reinking, who's a physical therapist, athletic trainer, um, from St. Louis. He went back to become a faculty member at SLU, and he told me that SLU was looking for a head athletic trainer in 2000, um, and I got the you know I came down and interviewed and got the job. Um, I think it surprised the heck out of my wife, but, um, but we're really, really glad uh, we made it. Um, St. Louis University has been so good to me, so good to our family. Um, pretty magical place. I, I really love the mission. I love, um, I have, I've, I, I tell somebody I wear every hat at SLU. I'm, I'm a graduate. Um, I'm a parent. I'm, I, was, I was a staff member. I'm a faculty member. And I'm, I give to the university. So I get all those donor calendars and everything like that. Do you get from that? So I'm pretty proud of SLU. I think it's a pretty amazing place. So 
I want to I want to back up to your Iowa experience for a minute. Yep. It sounds like at Florida you worked with two specific programs, you know, in your in your years there. But when you were at Iowa, did you shift to all the different programs? Because yeah, I, yeah, I got a chance to work with a lot of programs at Iowa. And actually, at Florida, the third team I worked with was um, actually I kind of worked with four. Nobody really worked with golf, but I took care of those guys. And we had like Dudley Hart on the team and Chris DeMarco, and we were really really good golfers and. Um, and the other team I worked with was swimming. So, um, and swimming had, uh, we had a freshman from Beverly Hills, California named Dara Torres. She oh, ended up being pretty good. Um, so um, we, you know, we, she was amazing at the, at the SEC swim meet that year. She, she broke the SEC record in the 50 free every, every, every heat she swam. And she was really a super person. Like the, what you see, on TV and all those, that's her. She's, she's like really legitimately pretty cool. But so, so I, I, you know, I worked with baseball. My first, my main sport was baseball, then football. And then I worked with swimming the spring after football season got done as I was wrapping up my master's degree. Um, but at, at Iowa, um, on my senior year, um, I was asked by the person who worked with men's gymnastics um, to be the men's gymnastics athletic trainer. Um, and really what's sad is that Iowa just decided to drop men's gymnastics, which is really, a pretty sad thing. I mean, I, I, one of my very good friends from college, he's the, he founded the company called Athletico. Um, and he's one of those people that are really disappointed. Mark Kaufman's his name. And um, he, he uh, he's pretty disappointed as, as are a lot of us alums that Iowa decided to drop as many sports as they did. Um, and, um, but in gymnastics, we got fifth in the nation. We got third in the big tens. Um, my junior year, I was with football and, um, I worked at, I worked the intensive wrestling camps for two summers in a row. So, um, we, we were pretty good in wrestling at Iowa back in those days. We, we, um, won the national championship every year and, and I worked with a bunch of Olympians at wrestling camps and stuff like that. So, so I got a chance to, to work with a lot of different sports at Iowa. Um, Lou Dolson, um, was our basketball coach when I first got there. Oh, wow. and then George Raveling was there a little while and, um, I mean, there was the, one of the greatest basketball games I've ever seen in my life was my freshman year. Um, we were still playing in the old field house before we moved into Carver Hawkeye arena. And we played, um, we played uh, uh, Minnesota for the big 10 championship. That was back when not many teams went to the NCAAs and, um, and it went, it was back in the days where they used to stall. Like they used to, you know, they used to stall and, and um, they beat us by, by a few points. Um, um, at the, at the Iowa field house for the big 10 championship. It was pretty, pretty wild. Like it was so cold outside. It was like, it was like 10 degrees outside. So there's like steam in the steam in the upper echelons of the field house. And it was pretty mystical. It was pretty cool. So that was, that was a pretty awesome game, but, but the, but the Billikens have had some pretty good games and maybe we can get around to talking about the, the Louisville game. Um, when we, when we get a chance as we talk. Yeah. Well, I, I was curious, um, you know, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but, you know, your decision to kind of work and continue your education at a small school uh, when you had, I mean, I, I'm guessing it has to do with the fact that you did all the big school stuff, uh, but what did you like more about working? What made you spend more time, so much time at SLU compared to, you know, moving around from big school to big school? Yeah, I, I mean, I went to 12 years of Catholic school um, when I when I came up. Um, I went to Dubuque Wallard High School. I went to Catholic grade school. Um, you know, I don't. Dubuque is like a Dubuque is like a um, uh, St. Louis divided by 10. I mean, it's very very Catholic, very German, Irish. Um, you know, it's got, you know, it, it's, it's just, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's right on the river. It's the oldest city in Iowa. St. Louis is the oldest city in, you know, Missouri. And, and so it's very, 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 very similar um, to that. But then I just, you know, I, I got a chance. It was really unique opportunity because um, if you're a full-time staff member, you can go to college tuition free at SLU. Um, Mark Reinking, my friend was, was, I was at the, at the time I started a program at Clark College in athletic training, and I was commuting back and forth and paying my own way at the University of Northern Iowa. And that was just, that was, that was, that was tough. So I started my doctoral study at the University of Northern Iowa. And then I got a chance to come down here when I can work and I can walk across campus and take my classes, which is really, really fun. And, and actually um, a great employee benefit at SLU. I, I would say that's probably 
there's some really talented people at SLU because of the benefits. It's, it's uh, to have that tuition remission for you and for your kids is, is pretty amazing. I mean, um, me working at SLU paid for, paid for my kids to go through um, private universities. And, and I'm very grateful for that. That's pretty amazing stuff. So, and um, the education program, the higher education leadership program at SLU is the best. It is absolutely the best. You look around the state, um, most of the superintendents have been that have PhDs have been educated at St. Louis University. So I was in a really outstanding program. And I really liked being at a place that didn't have football. Um, if you're the head athletic trainer, um, and that's the reason why when I did my dissertation, I, I did it with, with a basketball programs at Jesuit universities without football because football just changes the calculus at a university. It just, everything is multiplied by five. And, um, and I like being at a place where the sports, the, the, I could work with multiple sports. I could really make a difference. Um, we needed to do some, when I came in September of, of 2000, um, we needed to do some things around culture. I think there was some, there was some, uh, my predecessors were, you know, it was a it was a tough working situation for them. They were in a, in a in kind of a not so nice facility, um, you know. And I had the benefit of a honeymoon period a little bit where I could where I could ask for some things. And so we cleaned the, we cleaned the place up. We got all matching tables in royal blue and logos. We we painted the place. We rearranged the offices so our staff would have private offices, which is really. Uh, an important thing. And we really focused on really creating a welcoming atmosphere for every athlete, not just, not just the basketball players, not just the soccer players. We wanted every cross country runner to, that come in there or swimmer or any of those people to feel like they're valued. Um, and I think I really liked that opportunity to do that. So um, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. So th that kind of brings me to another question. I'm kind of curious because for those uh, people listening who don't know, I was a manager at SLU. I, I got there a year after you. So I showed up in fall 2001 um, as a freshman and was a manager for the men's basketball team for four years. Um, so I, I know I know you through men's basketball, but yep. what, what, what did you work with all the teams? Did Like what, what games would you be at? So, I, mean, I, so, I didn't have a really good sense of, of your whole scope of responsibility. There, there is not a chance in the world for the benefit of our athletes at St. Louis University, the standards of care, the standards of expectations of care have improved dramatically. Um, when I was there, we had, when I first started, we had three and a half positions, uh, two and a half positions, um, athletic training, or th uh, three, three um, athletic training positions to take care of 300 and some athletes. Right. Um, so basically my first year, the, the first week, as soon as I was licensed, the first week I was there, I was on a plane going to Charlotte with the women's soccer team. Yeah. I was, I was taking care of field hockey. I was, I was, um, and then men's basketball, there's a little bit more structure around men's basketball back then. You know, the individuals were truly individual. They weren't these kind of group individuals where technically they're a practice, but they're, they're not. Um, so really we had that, you know, you were a part of it, Pete, that midnight madness on the first day of practice and all that stuff in October. And that, that weekend, I would always, I would always, because our women's basketball athletic trainer would travel with women's soccer, I would always cover both teams that whole weekend. So I would tell my, I would tell my wife and kids, I'm like, just go visit your, go home and visit your parents. I'm going to be at the gym the whole weekend because I got the cover both teams. And, um, and that just, that was just my life for, you know, six, six years as a, until we hired more staff, which is about 2004, 2005, we were able to bring in a, a women's basketball athletic trainer. And then they've added a fifth athletic trainer. So they have five athletic trainers now, um, which is, which is great, which is really, which is what needed to happen. And so I, I've, I've traveled with it. I I've traveled with almost every sport, field hockey, um, volleyball, baseball, um, uh, um, men's basketball, um, uh, I, I, I really didn't travel with women's basketball because we always had to keep two people separated because they were always on an opposite schedule of us. So, um, but yeah, no, it, it was, um, it was quite a, a building. Um, but I really, I mean, some of my greatest memories are with some of those other teams. I, I really enjoyed 
Um, you know, I, I, I was there when Marilyn Nolan was there when I first got there with volleyball. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, um, and then when Ann Cordes came, it was, uh, I was, you know, I, I, I was asked to travel with her because it was her first job. And um, I really knew how, how road trips worked. And, you know, I knew all the nuts and bolts of the conference USA. So I knew my way around all the gyms and arenas and all those types of things like that. So I traveled with them. Um, and, and, and she was amazing. Like literally those, there's not a better motivator that I've ever been around than Ann Cordes. She just, she, she, she expected nothing from her athletes that she didn't expect from herself effort wise. She brought it every second. And she was so supportive to me. Like she would call me up and say, Hey, I need to move practice up a little bit because somebody's got an exam. How much time do you need to get the team ready? Like she would literally ask me, she would schedule her practice time around the time that I need. Um, but, you know, that didn't quite happen in men's basketball. Um, they would, I would, you know what, you know what my trick in men's basketball was, Pete? I would always have one player that they couldn't practice without that I had to take care of that would always text me if practice changed. So Kevin Lish was my guy, like literally, Kev, if they change practice, don't, don't think they told me text me and and, because they I mean they wouldn't practice without Kevin I mean he was you know he was awesome so uh so that was my Marquis Perry is my other guy like Marquis and and uh or Fish Josh Fisher or um or uh or Kevin they would always keep me in the loop Bryce Husak Ian Vujukas those guys would keep me you you chose the right guys yeah oh yeah yeah they were yeah you you mentioned you mentioned guys that they can't practice without. Um, I, I saw a thing on, on Facebook or Twitter or whatever it was about Allen Iverson and how they had to like hide his Jersey from him at times or his shoes. So he couldn't play because he was injured. Yep. Was there, were there any players out there that were kind of like that, that came through? So, I mean, any sport, but. Oh, I mean, um, almost all of them, to be honest with you. I mean, there was very few people that, especially coming to a place like SLU, you know, you're, you're not, there's not a over, overboard sense of entitlement, especially back in those days when you were, your locker room was in the basement of West Pine gym. You, you had no air conditioning in your practice gym. I mean, you know, you know, who was the two most impressive people were Josh Fisher and Marky Perry. Literally they knew that they never left the game. So they would actually play with the scout team when their the first team wasn't in. They would just switch. They would switch their jerseys and switch over and play. The Marquis and Josh never sat out of practice. They and they were they they could play 40 minutes because they were just in such great shape. They were, and um, I think Josh Fisher is one of the most underrated basketball players in SLU history. There he there were guys that just didn't want the ball in their hand when he was guarding them. He was just that, he was just that tenacious of a defender. And he, and he was a good guy. He was a good, good teammate. Um, He's, he's, he's living in Madrid now. Um, He's uh, he's, he has a basketball school over there because he played pro in Spain for quite a long time. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, no, he's a, he's a, he's a really good guy. So Fisher actually, uh, one of my favorite things is, uh, th- those were the, those were the years that Dwayne Wade was at Marquette, uh, yeah, his, oh, yeah. his two seasons either their final four run. He's he held Dwayne Wade remember. to, uh, the worst three games of his college yeah. career all came against Fisher, oh, yeah. um, his, his two lowest scoring games. And then the other two games, he, he just had like, he was like six for 20, like he had double digits, but it didn't come easy. Um, Fisher had his number. There were people at the time, like a, I remember a Miami journalist back in, you know, like the, when he was winning titles with the Heat, um, was saying somebody needs to sign Josh Fisher to guard him in the NBA because nobody else can stop him yeah. right now. Yeah, Fish Fish was so physically strong. Like he was, oh, yeah. he was like he was like a weight room strong guy, and that yeah. that was back when, you know, we didn't have the the sophisticated strength staff that we have now at SLU, we kind of, the coaches kind of had some programs. We had, we had one person that would work as the strength coach for everybody. Um, and I remember when we brought in Mike Lynn, um, who moved here from UCLA, he was a strength coach there. He came to, he came to uh, St. Louis for personal reasons. And, and one of the things that I, <laughs> one of the things that we knew we had to do is upgrade the weight room to like more Olympic weights. So literally 
to tell you how things worked at SLU at the time. Literally, we found somebody to order them from. They had a semi delivered to the backside of West Pine Gym. And we got a bunch of kids that we paid work study money to, to bring the weight platforms in through the tunnel because there was no elevator mm -hmm. in that gym. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's down in that old kind of dungeony. Uh, but then he took the room next to it and made it into like a plyo room and stuff. He did a really good job. Um, he's really the first strength coach that we had that really elevated things, elevated expectations. And then, um, and then from that point on, our expectations as a, as an athletic department improved so that they always would replace him with, you know, somebody that was very qualified. Yep. Eric Shork or, or uh, the, the uh, Rob Hornet, the one they have now and his staff. Yep. So yeah, no, I, I agree. Yep. So you came in under, under Doug Woolard and uh, you had four years under Doug Woolard and then uh, Levick uh, came in in 04. Uh, what was the difference between kind of, you had Doug Woolard, who was kind of like an old guard kind of, you know, I don't want to say older guy, but you know, he, and then you had Levick who was kind of more, uh, and Cordis like, uh, yeah. more kind of uh, fiery. Um, what what did you see the difference in that? What changes did you see? The, the difference is is there's two schools where administrators come from. They come from the development side, or they come from the student services side. And like for example, to to give you an example of somebody now, Janet Oberly comes from the student services side. She knows everything that happens. I mean, she was an assistant soccer coach on my very first road trip, we traveled together. So Janet and I, we both were in PhD program together. I mean, I'm so happy that she finished her PhD, that's wonderful. So Cheryl Levick was really a chief of staff at, at Stanford. She, she, she walked in the athletic training room and she could name every machine we had. She'd do all that. Whereas, whereas Doug would rather work with the donors. He'd rather, you know, and it's neither one's a bad thing, but it really was their approach. So. So, um, so uh, you know, Doug would left the senior associate athletic director, Lori Flanagan, kind of run our side of the house, um, and he would he would take care of the bigger, um, the bigger kind of matters. But Cheryl really knew every aspect of, and she was a tremendous mentor to me when I was making the decision to move over to academics. She really sat down with me for quite a long time and really talked about what my priorities were, what I wanted to do, and and um, I I've. I've, I really value her mentorship and, and, and I, I will argue to this day and Kim Tucci will tell you this too, that Chaffetz Arena is the way it is because of Cheryl Levick. Absolutely positively. Um, Father Biondi um, really envisioned more of kind of a bigger arena that, that was more of like Scott Trade Enterprise Center. Um, whereas, whereas Cheryl knew that we needed an athletic department building. Like we needed that practice gym, we needed locker rooms, we needed, we needed a, a state-of-the-art weight room, we needed all that stuff, and we needed it close to our outdoor facilities, and Cheryl really fought to get that, to get that pavilion built, um, and, um, and that, as a result, they had to take one, take the upper deck off of it, and just have it be a one, and I'll tell you this, it's, Chaffetz Arena is the most beautiful place to watch a basketball game in college basketball, there's not a bad seat in the house, you know, and those scoreboards in the corners, the scoreboards in the corners were from the University of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I remember when Father Biondi went to watch us play at the Dean Dome. When he got back, he was telling people, I, I really don't, I really like not having a scoreboard in the middle. I like having the big video boards in the corner like the Dean Dome has. And, um, and that's part of the decision there. And I think it's really been very prescient. I mean, it allows them to host a lot of events and stuff in there because you don't have this big freaking scoreboard in the middle, you know, pretty cool. Yeah, they did it right for sure. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. So you also saw a transition between men's basketball coaches, which I guess for your day to day wasn't as impactful, but you know, uh, Lorenzo Romar and Brad Soderbergh were two pretty different guys. So what, what's the experience like there going from one to another? I mean, they really impacted my quality of life a lot. And okay. As and, much and, as the AD or, or, Oh no. The, the, I mean, cause of my responsibilities with men's basketball, they scheduled everything. They, you know, pretty much my routine was really, it started with men's basketball, then worked its way out. Right. It, sure. You know, that, that was always, you know, the head, when you're the head athletic trainer at a school where basketball is, is the main sport, you, 
you make sure you take care of basketball. Not that I, I thought less of other teams. I just, I just, we just knew that. And everybody kind of knew that, like you just had to, you know, make sure. And, and so up, it's up to me to build a relationship with the coaches and say, Hey, you know what, in this situation, I really need to be able to, you know, take this trip with volleyball and stuff like that. And, and those types of things. And they were pretty cool about that. Um, Lorenzo Romar was one of the most awesome people ever. I mean, there's yeah. a reason he can recruit the way he does. People are just drawn to him. He's so funny. Yeah, like he'll sit there and joke for 45 minutes after practice. And it is the, it is the, I can tell you a story about either. It's a great segue into a story. When we were at Charlotte and Charlotte had like Rodney White and a bunch of guys, they were really good. They had Bobby Lutz was their coach and they played really fast. And that gym was really hot there. And we get there and we thought we had a pretty good team. And we're down like 18 at halftime. Just, we look terrible. We look so bad. And we get in the locker room. And I remember standing in the back of the room with, with Declan O'Neill, the manager, one of the, the senior manager, and, um, and Doug McElhager. We we're standing in the back of the room. And he starts going off on the team. And he's so witty. Like, he's so funny. <laughs> that we were, we, you know, we're losing by 18 points. Like we're back there biting our tongue and biting our lip because he's just so funny. And, 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 and the guys came back and, and, you know, the one thing they say about those Charlotte teams is, you know, they'll, they'll blow you out, but then they'll let you back into it. And that's kind of the way they do. They just, they just chuck it a lot. And if they're hot, they'll beat you. They're not, they won't. And, and so, um, so that was funny. And then, then when Randy Bennett, after my first year, Randy Bennett went to St. Mary's and he always said he wanted to end up in the West Coast Conference. Like he'd, when we would go on trips, he's like, he'd always be checking the West Coast Conference scores. He's like, that's the league to coach in. That's awesome. We can get international players there. We can do all those kind, kind of things like that. You know, that's Gonzaga was in that league and, and all that kind of stuff like that. And then, um, but then they were looking for, and I knew Brad because his first coaching job was at Loris College in Dubuque. And his wife actually worked in the clinic that I helped run, the, the sports medicine clinic. And so I knew Brad from his first job at Loris College. And, and Lorenzo comes into me and says, you know, I've, I've talked to Brad Soderberg. I said, I, I know him. I mean, he's, he's an amazing tactical coach. He's, he, can, he can do a scout like no tomorrow. And probably the best scout that he's ever, ever done. And he had some other assistant coaches that helped with it too. Is, is, I don't know if you were there. One thing I'm a real, I'm a real teamwork coaching nerd. Like I loved going to team meetings. I love watching coaches teach and practice. I just, I just, and that's the reason why I think I'm a big interprofessional education person. Cause I just love the idea of bringing teams together and, and accomplishing more and all those types of things like that. So, so I remember the meeting that we did the week of the Louisville game and Louisville was ranked third in the country. And, and he sat down with the guys and they had meticulous film study and they went through and they said, they, you know, we didn't really have a team meeting when we met in the coach's office is where we met most of the time. And he said, here's the deal. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to beat Louisville and we're going to do it this way. But if we don't do it this way, they're going to blow us out of the gym. And so you, everyone's got to do it. And, and they went through every single player and they had film broke down on them of them doing what's called true gold or fool's gold. Fool's gold is something like you made this shot one time playing pick up with your buddies, you know, these fall away three falling into the stands probably. And I don't think Drew Diener will mind me saying this. Drew, Drew, <laughs> Drew, when he was on a roll, he would catch the ball. He'd be in, he'd be in uh, rhythm, but then every once in a while he would just chuck a ball up. And, and most of the time he was trying to draw a foul when he did it, but, but, um, but and they would go through every guy said, okay, see what this you you're, you're chucking up a, a three on first pass. That's fool's gold. You're not going to make that shot. But when we get the ball reversed and it comes back to you and you catch it in rhythm, that's the shot you need to take. That's your true gold shot. The Marquis Perry, every shot's true gold for you. Like you can take any shot you want. Like that's one of the things they told them. And, um, but they went through every single guy in the team and they showed them, this is what you need to do. This is what you shouldn't do. And we played so disciplined in that game and we just frustrated Louisville. They just, 
they just get bored. Those really high level teams, they just get bored playing defense for 30 seconds. So, you know, they, they kind of give you an easy basket late in the clock just because they're, they're, they're just don't want to play defense anymore. And, um, but yeah, no, that was, that was Brad, Brad, you know, when I saw, when I see Brad coaching with Virginia now, and I see the, I see the pack defense for Virginia. I was like, Oh man, I've, I've seen that getting taught. You know, Peter will tell you this. We would always, we'd always taught close out screening sequence, get to the pack. Peter's put down more tack line pack lines on the court with tape than anybody that was my <laughs> every job. single day. <laughs> yeah. But you, that pack defense and he took it to Virginia, you know, when he worked with Tony Bennett, cause they knew each other from their dad. And, and, um, but that's his, he is, and they're two and, and Brad and Lorenzo are really complimenting each other. Well, and then uh, yeah. we knew when we knew Lorenzo was going to leave, like we played out at Washington and he, he played at Washington and, and like, they were falling over him over there. They like, we're like, I think Lorenzo is going to end up at Washington <laughs> because they just, they were in love with him out there. Cause he, you know, he played there, played in the NBA, those kind of things like that. Yeah, that's um, I I had for, I forgot about that fool's gold thing until you mentioned that, but that uh, that Louisville game was huge. That was his first season, so that was my sophomore year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we rattled off like eight straight starting yeah. with that game. So that that kind of um, rescued the season that yeah. otherwise looked like a, a it was going to be a disappointing one. So that, that yeah, was, we were, we ended up being a top four seed in the conference to say that year. Yeah, that's right. I remember remember at Freedom Hall we, we we played there, and the old Freedom Hall used to have those hustle stats. Yeah, and UAB with Mike Anderson was playing Marquette the game before us, and they're killing them. They're killing Marquette, and you look up and there's there's thirty turnovers for Marquette on the little board, and you're like, you're like, what? That Travis Steiner's their point guard, Dwayne Wade. Yeah. They got you know all these guys, and um, they ended up going to the Final Four that year, and um, but UAB blew them out. Um, and we beat Southern Miss right after that. And then we played in the next round, we played UAB and they got a big lead on us. We came back. Uh, Marquis had a last second shot to, to take us to the finals. Didn't make it. And that's, we, I think we were, we were an NIT team that year. I think we played Minnesota in the NIT or something like that. Yeah. At Scott trade. And we lost yeah. that one. Yeah. 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 We talked about uh, – I wanted to actually get your – since we were going on about a game, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the the uh, December 30th, 2000 game at Iowa. You got to go back home. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, how was that? A couple, a couple things were cool. Number one, because not a lot of our players wanted tickets, I basically used up almost all the player tickets on my family. Like I literally – we had the three rows behind – and my kids were like – four and seven so i mean they were so excited and they knew all the guys on the team and all that kind of stuff like that which is way cool um and that was a tough game for us because they iowa had a good team then they were they were they were pretty good um but the other thing that was cool is i got a chance to pick where we eat and everything which was which was way good so so one of the things we did is like we're ordering happy joe's pizza and happy oh, joe's is a, is, a, is a legend in and what was really, really cool is the guy who delivered the pizza was a kid I took care of in high school in Dubuque, Iowa. He's like, I saw your name on that order and I had to deliver the pizza. And he, he talked to me for about 15 minutes. I brought him in and I introduced him to the team and everything. And uh, like little things like that are pretty awesome. I, 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 you know, cause I was, I did a lot of, you know, when I was in Iowa, I was president of the Iowa Athletic Trainer Society. I did a lot. I'm, I'm still a pretty connected alum. Um, my mentors um, just all just retired just in the past few years. Um, so, so it was real. it meant a lot to me. The game that really meant a lot to me was the NIT victory out at oh, yes. St. Charles. Because yeah. those are my dudes right there. That was Chris Sloan. Mm -hmm you know, passing it out to Anthony Drea, hitting the, hitting the bucket to win it. I think you were, you, I, I popped in on a, uh, on a, a live watch you did with Drea. Yeah. Um, but that, that was, was a lot of fun. That was awesome. That was just, that was one of the coolest, that, that was one of the, cause it was so surreal. I mean, that, 
that that gym floor was had all the the purple insect yeah. on it and all that. Yeah. it was on big espn because it was one of those nights where it, it was a late game and it just was so you know every one of my friends back in iowa watched the game it was just it was so cool and and to win on a last second shot like that that was really that was a ton of fun that was really that was that st charles family arena is not a bad arena the problem is it's like not close to anything i mean it's pretty far yeah. away I, I know you, uh, I know you, you know, you were, that was around the, the time we still played at Scott trade, but uh, how much more difficult was it to, to do your job uh, having to drive whatever 30 minutes, you know, to get stuff there? Yeah, no, I, 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 I love being in that arena cause it's a really, really nice arena. And when we, when we packed it, it was an amazing crowd. Like when we played North Carolina, we mm-hmm. played, Cincinnati. I mean, my first year, we had over 14,000 season ticket holders my first year. I mean, it was, we just come off the miracle in Memphis. Everybody was jacked about everything. Um, but when it was empty, when we were playing Tennessee Tech on a Thursday in, in December, you know, it was tough. It was 5,000 in that place is not very much. But so we had a locker room. Uh, we had a locker room and then we had a little athletic training room and it said Billiken's locker room on it. Um, and then we had a little meeting room in front. We never really could leave anything in the locker room. So everything we, we took down there, we had to set up that morning. So normally what I would do is it takes a little while for the hot pack machines and stuff to get warmed up. So I would usually go down probably about an hour before shoot around, which is usually whenever the guys get out of class. So like 11 or 12 or something like that. And then I would plug it in. And then I would, you know, there's usually a few guys that we hit the tape for shoot around because they're kind of dinged up. And then I would go back and I would, you know, we, you know me and the managers would kind of clean things up and stuff. I'd go back to my office for a couple hours and work and take care of the other teams that were there. So volleyball would be practicing. So I'd help them get ready for practice and all those types of things like that. And then, and then we'd go down, um, I'd go over and eat pregame meal with the, with the team and and then I would usually go right from pregame meal down to the arena, make sure everything was set up. I, I like kind of that quiet time in the arena, getting that kind of that hour before everybody starts showing up. Um, that was always, that was always pretty, pretty nice. That's one of my favorite times. And, and then we, you know, then things would get rocking and rolling. The players would start streaming in and we'd get them taken care of and, and, um, and who knows what'll happen, but, but it was, it was, it was hard. It was, um, the hard part was it was hard for our, our fans to get there. So it never, I mean, I remember that when Chaffetz opened and cause I've had season tickets at Chaffetz since it opened. I, that was something that was pretty important to me is, you know, I probably could have with my connections, get free tickets and stuff like that. I I felt that I always felt that those people sitting behind us in the bleachers can say whatever they want because they bought their ticket. Like literally you know, most of the time our fans yell at the refs. They don't really yell at our players and coaches and stuff like that. But, um, but I wanted to, I wanted to support the team. I, I, I've paid for season tickets uh, since I moved over to academics and it's really been pretty special. We've had the same seats at, Sh- at Chaffetz. I sit with my family, like my, when my kids went off to college, they're like, you better not sell those extra two seats. I'm like, no, so we kept four seats the entire time. And, but the first time I remember walking to Chaffetz, in, in the fall, it was like at a, a November game and from the parking garage. It's the first time I've ever been to a game at Chaffetz and, and there's leaves blown around and a huge big crowd of students walking down from the dorms. I'm like, God, this is what being in a college campus feels like. This is so awesome. And that was, that was just the best. And, you know, obviously, you know, with Rick Majerus coming and, and now Travis Ford, um, it's uh you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a great place. It's a great place. And I love, I really love Travis's approach. I think he, he gets it. He gets being a part of a university community. He gets that culture building part, um, which I think is really, really important, especially recruiting a lot of those St. Louis kids. I think, um, you know, if we would have had, you know, I would argue that we probably would have won the A-10 this year if we would have had fans in the seats, I think, uh, because we do have such a home court advantage um, at Chaffetz, so. For sure. Yeah. It, I, I don't miss those days as I'm, I mean, I, I miss that experience, but I don't miss lugging though. We had hockey bags as man. Yeah. Yeah. For all we would take down those all chairs. Yeah. Yeah. We had, yeah. We had to carry those chairs when Soderbergh uh, took over. 
uh, towels, but we had, um, you know, we would strap those on a manager's back and I used to get those like, like bruises right here from carrying those down. Pile, two, oh, pile all the managers in two cars. Oh, but, yeah. um, so you, you also had to coordinate, I guess, all the, the student trainers. I mean, obviously, Stu yep. has a, a great PT program, you know, with yep. all these bright students to, to help out. So what, what's that process like? How, See, how did you pick who did what? So so what, what happened was that there's, a, there's kind of two generations of that. So up until 2003, somebody who's got any major at all, who's taken a certain amount of classes, could become an athletic trainer. So it's called the internship program. And, and so we had a lot of PT students that were doing that. So um, there's probably there's probably 50 or so students that I've sponsored for certification through that. So generally speaking, what we'll do is we'll we'll have um, we would have a sign up sheet for the year. Um, we'd give the upperclassmen first shot at stuff, and then the, uh, we'd fill in the ranks. If someone was a local person, they would get a lot of those over Christmas break games um, so that they would be the person right behind the bench. Um, but they were pretty invaluable. Um, that was a great group. And then, and then after 2003, um, until we started an athletic training education program at SLU, um, we, we just had kind of work study students and stuff like that were kind of interested, but they really couldn't become athletic trainers. And then now that we've started our athletic training program, um, my students that I teach in class are the ones that um, have sport assignments with, you know, with JB or, or they're really assigned to a preceptor. So they're assigned to either Jonathan Birch or Petra or, or um, Elena or Angie or Ben. Um, and they all do a fantastic job. I was, I told, I told this to, um, if it wasn't for SLU's athletic department this year, we probably would have had some students that would be would would not have stayed on track to graduate if if SLU athletics wouldn't have come through for us last wow. summer with COVID. They were able to take all of our, our students who were set to go to clinicals all over the country over the summer. And they were saying, just send us everyone you got and we'll make it work. And and they did. And that, that allowed our students to stay on track for graduation. So um, that was that was a pretty that was pretty awesome. And I, I made sure I I made sure that the the powers that be knew that because they they really came through for us big time, um, and we try to help out with athletics as much as we can. Um, I helped out with the track meet a couple of weeks ago, and that's those types of things like that. Tim Howell, one of our faculty, helped with field hockey a lot this spring because when they play so far off campus, it's kind of difficult um, for their staff to get off campus. So he helped them out quite a bit. So um, that that type of thing like that. I got a great Travis Ford story for you. So let's go. Okay. Yeah, let's so it. I remember when Travis first got hired, they had kind of an alumni kind of get together to get to know Travis. And, and I said to him, I said, and do you remember the A-10 tournament at Atlantic City? Do you guys remember that one? We played at yeah. Atlantic City and we had a good team. Like we had, we had a 20 win team. That was Brad Soderberg's last year. And we get there and the word was, is that St. Joe's had the flu. So St. Joe's got kind of sick on their last regular season game and they drove down on their bus and they played UMass in the first round. St. Joe's gave UMass the flu. And then we played UMass and UMass gave us the flu and we beat them. And then we played George Washington and got beat in the, in the semis and we had Tommy Liddell, Kevin Lish, um, Ian Vujukas. And, and I said that to Travis and he says, he says, he says do you want something? The A-10 tournament, when you were coaching UMass against us, your team got the flu, didn't it? He's like, yeah, I, I've been telling people that. St. Joe's got us sick. And, 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 then, and then they got us sick. Like, remember Greg, our manager, he was in the ER in, during the game, he was in the ER in Atlantic City because he was so sick from the flu. Like literally the flu went through the entire tournament and, 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 you know, I mean, and, uh, it was crazy. I, mean, I told him that story and he, he's like, yeah, I, I was telling people that, that we had a great team that year. And, and cause it was a big upset when we beat them and, um, it was cause they had the flu. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That was funny. That is you, uh, you weren't there for the, uh, the 20 point game against George Washington. Were you, were you, um, Oh, was, was, was Majerus coaching? Yeah, that was Majerus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, was, I mean, I was a fan. I mean, I was, oh, okay. I was No, there. I didn't yeah, know yeah. if you were, because uh, I, I didn't was, know if you were I was not, I did not have the pleasure of ever being in the locker room with Coach Majerus. 
I got to know him. I was kind of while they're waiting to hire Jonathan Birch, I was I was kind of in that I was over in ac academics and helping out as the head athletic trainer that summer. Um, and so I got to know Porter. I got to know Porter Moser. I got to know Rick Majerus um, uh, and a couple of their other coaches. And um, and I knew most of the guys because most of the guys were kind of because Coach Majerus got hired so late. Most of the guys were the, were the guys I took care of. Um, so they all kind of knew me and stuff like that. And and um, they did they did pretty pretty rigorous strengthening conditioning over the summer. And um, we had a couple guys with some injuries that needed to get kind of taken care of over the summer, and then, and then uh, we transitioned to JB and and um, and uh, went from there. But yeah, Coach Majerus was an interesting guy. He's he's um, you know I lived in Milwaukee for a couple of years, so all my friends up in Milwaukee in athletic training all kind of know him, and and he, he's old school guy. So what he does, and I've been around people like this before, is that he challenges you. So what he does is. If you walk in thinking you know what you're talking about, what he'll do is he'll just he'll see he'll see how much resolve you have. So he'll he'll come to you and he'll challenge what you're saying and stuff like that. And you he'll either see if you cave or if you stand up for yourself and you and you advocate for yourself and those kind. And once you do that, he's got your back all the time. Like literally, once I he challenged me probably in the first week or two when we had to. We, we were having a discussion about one of the players and stuff like that. And I wanted them to, and they needed to take a little bit of a week or so off because they just were dealing with something. And, you know, and, and he's like, what are you talking about this summer? They shouldn't be taking any time. You know, that type of thing like that. I just, please just, you know, give them a little time. And then, and then, and then we were cool from that point forward. Like he just, that's just kind of the way he operated. He just kind of tried to challenge you a little bit and just see how you reacted to it. And that was really kind of coach Majerus' style. And, and um, I had a good relationship with him. I, I didn't work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, but I interacted with them and, and they really, the, the people in the basketball office really supported us. You know, I knew Rachel Diener, who was their um, kind of their uh, office manager and those types of things. Cause I, I knew the whole Diener clan. So. So that was kind of a, a big transition year because that's a year. So you finish your PhD that year. And I guess you kind of intimated at this earlier after talking to Cheryl, um, had you already kind of made the decision that you were going to transition? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, role that year? I, um, I, I told them at the end of the basketball season, I told them in mm -hmm. March that I was going to move over when the new faculty contracts start in July. So, and they actually let me start earlier so I could recruit students into our program. Um, and so a little bit about my PhD. So, so um, I think that's kind of one of the cool threads. Like I, my PhD was in higher education leadership. It was not in athletic training. It, um, Cause I'm, like I said before, I'm kind of a, kind of a team science kind of nerd. I, I really enjoy watching coaches coach. I watch seeing how teams work, those types of things. And a lot of my scholarship has been in that area. Um, but um I would, I would travel around with our team and I'd be like, all these Jesuit schools, they're kind of the same school, right? They're urban, they have a Jesuit mission. They're kind of all use the same terms like AMDG, Cura Personalis, Set the World on Fire, Persons for Others, all that. But some are really, really good at basketball and sports and some are not so good, right? And so I wanted to find out what set the, the, what set the um, the teams apart from each other. So what I did is I took my classes and I could take about two classes a semester. I'd run out after, they were, most, they were designed for working people. So they, they were always in the evening, um, which worked out really, usually Monday nights or Tuesday nights or something like that. And then I would do a lot of my reading and writing when I went on road trips. So I, you have a lot of hotel time and road trips, so it worked out pretty well. So hopefully I wasn't taking too much time away from my family. And then, um, then it came time for me to gather my data. So one year in June, I did, it was kind of my voyage of discovery. I went all over and interviewed these coaches because I knew a coach like Sean Miller or Dana Altman or Phil Martelli weren't going to tell me a lot on the phone. They just, they, they, you know, who knows, it could be outside the lines trying to talk to them, you know, who knows who's trying to talk to them. So, so I really, I knew that if I went and talked to them, I went to their office and interviewed them, they'd be pretty forced, forthright with me. And it was pretty amazing. So I, I went east and I went to Philly and I went to Loyola University of Maryland and interviewed their coach. And then I went 
um, to California because my brother lived out in the Bay Area and I went to Santa Clara and San Francisco. I was all set to interview Mark Few, but I couldn't I couldn't get to Spokane. It just didn't work out for me. And then I went to um, I stayed with my aunt and uncle in northern um, northern Indiana. And I went took the train into Chicago to interview the Loyola person. I went up to um, uh, went up to Detroit to do the University of Detroit coach. And then my daughter went on a college visit to Xavier and I we interviewed we interviewed Sean Miller at Xavier, and then she went on a college visit to Creighton, and we interviewed um, uh, Dana Altman at Creighton. So I was able to, and then obviously Brad Soderberg. I interviewed him, um, being our coach. But but uh, it was pretty. It was a pretty. Uh, um, it was a pretty amazing experience, um, and I got a lot of insight into why some teams do better than others. And I, I think it came down to three C's: um, uh, culture, commitment, and consistency. So culture is. They 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 have a winning culture, you know, all the way from the president, all the way down to, to you know the the freshman that's on the spirit squad, the whole nine yards, they believe that they can win. And I remember them saying at St. Joe's, they said, "We do not use our gym as an excuse. We believe that we can, we can be a championship team, you know, whatever." Um, uh, commitment that means investment, right? Spending money on it. Actually, at the time because charters weren't as common as they are now. Right. Every coach said charters. Charters improved the quality of life of a basketball player and team so much better. You know, Peter's been on these trips, right? First flight out the morning after the game, you don't get in till, you know, 11 o'clock or noon. You've been up since five o'clock in the morning. You take a charter, game gets over, you're back in your bed by midnight. You go to all your classes the next day. Um, you get to practice on campus the day before, you don't have to do a, find a practice in that town. Um, you know, even though, uh, commercial flights out of St. Louis aren't too bad, but, but charters really, that, that's one of the commitment things. And the third thing is consistency. If you think about every time a new administrator comes in, they always want to kind of hire their person. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and as a result, if there's places where there's turnover in presidents, provosts, athletic directors, those types of things like that, um, they find that that's challenging to maintain a consistent winning culture when you have a lot of administrators that go through. So um, those are the three things that I, I found in my dissertation. So, so did, hold, you're, hold on, I got, I, got, I got the question of all questions from A10 okay. Twitter. Did we <laughs> solve why Fordham is so bad? <laughs> Fordham, Fordham is, the thing is that's, it's, have you ever been to Rose Hill gym? I have not. I need to. It makes, it makes West Pine gym look palatial. <laughs> it's also, um, they just, if they practice in that gym and played like in a, in a, an arena, kind of like what Seton Hall does. And, and those types of things are, are St. John's when they play in Madison square garden and those types of things like that. And then maybe play their non-conference games. That's just not, that is literally, Rose Hill gym and Tom Gola arena are high school gyms. I mean, they really are. I remember, I remember, I remember in a locker room on a Saturday at LaSalle and they were having this big regional swim meet going on and we're doing our, we're doing our pregame talk and then walks some kid in a speedo from the pool. <laughs> and, we're like, and we're like, Oh gosh. Um, but yeah, no, I would say, I would say, you know, that's that's a sign of commitment, right? Facility, right? And and one of the things that St. Joe's did is they kept their on-campus building, but they remodeled it quite a bit. So all of the facilities around it are are new. They redid everything. Um, they kept they liked the feel of that place, but um, they, you know, you know, they put they put updated seating, sound system, locker rooms. Uh, they went into this building and added a bunch of stuff on. They were doing that when I was there interviewing um, Coach Martelli. So, so building on that, you've got Fordham, you know, down at the bottom of, of your kind of the set you're looking at. You've got somebody like Gonzaga, who's now, you know, up at the top and maybe places like, like Xavier and, and Georgetown arguably are kind of up there too. And then in the middle, you've got SLU. So yep. when you look at, at SLU through the framework of, of your work, 
uh, what what is it that you think SLU does well, and what's what's lacking? What what needs to change there? Not have COVID happen. <laughs> no, no, seriously, no. I I am so impressed with everything they're doing around SLU's program. I think the support they're getting, the investment they're making, um, the team we have, good coaching, um, good fan support. Um, but I can't say that we've had that for a long time, right? I mean, then there was barriers to that, right? You're not going to get a good student section when they got to get on yellow school buses and drive down to Scott Trade Center or Savas Center or whatever. You're not going to get, um, you need a coach that works the room like Travis Ford does. Travis Ford walks across campus with donuts and all of that stuff on the first day of classes and, 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 and he knows how to work. And the one thing that, that I don't think people realize is that we had open practices when we were at West Pine gym, yeah. like literally there would be, if, if a 10 Twitter existed the way it does now back then, Oh my God, we'd have our, we'd have, we'd be having people X and O and up in the upper deck of the yeah. balcony. Yeah. We had, we had girlfriends up there. We had, we had the fans that would just, you know, the retired guys that would just come to watch media every Tuesday would be our media day. So um, Monday would be when they would go to the Rams Tuesday would be when they'd be come to the Billikens and literally before practice, there'd be five cameras all lined up. Boom, 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 boom. They would do their interviews, shoot some B roll. And um, you'd have Fox sports Midwest. You'd have the, the local stations um, that would be there. One of the funniest media stories is, and I, were you, were you there with the free throw ladder, Peter? Yes, I was. Yeah, the, yeah. the free throw ladder. And so one of the things that Coach Soderberg did to kind of bring the team together, they had everybody associated with the program on this free throw ladder. So all the managers, the coaches, and all the players had to do a free throw competition at the end of practice. One of the guys quit. So they needed, they had an odd number. They needed somebody else to be in the free throw ladder. So they put me on the free throw ladder. <laughs> Here I am, like half the time I had a shirt and tie on dress pants, dress shoes. And then I'm trying to get the team done after practice. And they'd go, they'd go, Tony, your turn to shoot. I'm like, I'd get to go out and shoot. And of course I was terrible. Like I was, and, and um, Joel Goldberg saw that. And he's like, what is your picture doing on the free throw ladder? I'm like, yeah, I'm on the free throw ladder. So he did a whole story on Foxburg Midwest about the free throw ladder and the managers were on there and all that. And my, my, I beat one player once and that was my claim to fame. That was like mic drop. It was done. Um, but who was it? I, I forget. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would never do that to somebody. I would never, ever do that. But, um, but I mean, you know, as a manager, Peter, if you beat one of the players in the free throw contest, you do not let them forget it. Yeah, it, gets it, brought it, up. it definitely happened a few times with, with some of our guys. Yeah, yeah. No, but you luck out every once in a while where they're having a bad yeah. day and you just you can't miss. And that but that was one of the cool things. Like we had that access to the media. Like that they would just stand there and talk to us. And it's kind of bigger now. Like you don't really have that level of access, but literally those guys are just and they had a job to do, right? They had to come get a couple of interviews on tape shoot some B-roll of us doing like layup lines and all that. And then they would leave, you know, that's kind of the way it works. So, so yeah, no, um, but yeah, that was, you know, I would say, I would say I am so utterly impressed with, with where we're going as an athletic department from head to toe. And I mean, I have some inside knowledge too. I mean, my, my daughter played softball for SLU. Um, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, Physical facilities are one thing, but as far as feeling supportive across the athletic department with academic support, strength and conditioning, all those types of things like that, we've come so far in the last 20 years. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. So consistency leading to culture that maybe, maybe a little more consistency and we'll get there. Yeah, no. And, and the culture starts with your coaches and your leadership, but then it becomes part of your players. And I would say, Part yeah. of the culture that's happening right now at SLU is we have some really, really solid upperclassmen and women athletes. You look at our women's soccer team, yeah. you look at our women's basketball team, you look at our, um, you know, uh, volleyball end up having a pretty decent season. Um, and you look at, you know, men's basketball with Jordan and Hassan and, and, and all those guys like that. And, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, 
people always tell you winning traditions come from the players. They start with the coaches and they, and they are sustained with the players. Like, I mean, there's a reason why all the Gonzaga guys kind of look the same because they're kind of drawn to that. Like that's where they want to go. Right. They want to be, they saw Adam Morrison play when they were a kid and they, and they want to be the next Adam Morrison, I guess. But, yeah. but, uh, um, but no, that's, it, it's, that's a tough place to play now. That's a really tough place. The kennel. Oh my yeah, gosh. For sure. you, oh, uh, you, they were ready for us. You mentioned, um, you know, not having COVID-19 happen. Can you, uh, do you have any insight as to what all they had to do? Like, I mean, what, what would it look like if you were still head trainer? Like, Oh, um, they really rely, they had to do so much testing. They had to do a ton of testing and actually, um, our students were trained to be COVID testers and they, they got a ton of experience doing that. Um, uh, they, uh, I mean, that's happening in universities all over the country. Uh, you, you got to test, 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 test. And then you got to make sure you catch stuff when it's, when people are asymptomatic, you quarantine them and, and then you do contact tracing and all those types of things like that. We are really fortunate at St. Louis University to have such a strong public health infrastructure. Um, we, I mean, I talked to my colleagues at other places. I mean, I mean, we just relied on our public health faculty like Terry Redman and, and um, Dr. Garza um, and, and things like that, that really, they helped really lead the charge and develop our policies. And, and we really had a great year of classes too. I mean, we had some kids go in quarantine and stuff like that, but we were able to do face-to-face -face labs for the whole fall um, with, pro with you know, using appropriate cohorting and contact tracing. We decreased the density of the labs. Um, we did, we did um, proper uh, masking and all those types of things like that. And we were, I mean, I teach a therapeutic modalities class with a hundred students in it with four labs a week. And we were able to get through this semester with, with really no one not being, no one that could not finish the class. I mean, everyone finished the class and they were able to make it through it. So the whole university really rallied around it, just not athletics. Um, but yeah, it's just testing, 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 and then following the rules. I mean, you know, if someone tests positive, you quarantine them, you, uh, you cohort them, you find out who they've been in contact, I mean, you contact trace, you find out who they've been in contact with, and then you hope that they don't get symptomatic. And if they get symptomatic, then that's a bigger issue. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, no, that's, that's kind of, the, that's kind of the way it works all across healthcare. So um, if you follow the rules, you can protect people. If people decide that they don't want to follow the rules, then it gets a little tougher. Do you are you surprised, and, and I'm not going to knock on wood here, uh, that, you know, we've made it through a college football season, a college basketball season uh, without any real, um, you know, catastrophic, uh, you know, outbreaks? I, I think that's because, you know, there was a commitment from the NCAA all the way down that if, if, if you don't have enough players, you don't play. Like, that's that's the thing and universities are probably number one you have a younger group that don't get as sick number two you have um number two you have a lot of control like in a school setting we have some carrots and sticks right you know you know coaches control two things they control scholarships and playing time right those are two of the things that people care about so if you as an athletic trainer if i get the coach on my side or if I get the coach to advocate for me, I can, that's a great way to get people to show up for treatment and do what we ask them to and all those types of things like that. In the general student population, we really don't have those carrots and sticks, right? You, you hope they do the right thing. You, you say, you know, please, we want to stay in class, those types of things like that. But in athletic departments and, and stuff, you can make people do stuff, right? You can, you can say, you know what? No one's following the rules. We're not going to practice today, you know. And and there was games that were canceled, right? We went 42 days without without practice and playing. And I mean, it, and it, it took its toll on our, on our on our men's team and our women's team, for that matter. Um, and uh, and you know that, but we didn't have any adverse events as far as people getting really sick with COVID or anything. And that's what's important, right? As frustrating it was to to thinking that we had a shot at the NCAA with both of those teams. The fact that we made it through the season with no really adverse incidents with COVID, 
in the long run is probably going to be something we'll look back upon like dang that we made it that was pretty awesome just what you were saying zach you know just like you know and that's because we have control in athletic departments you have control whereas general student body and our population you hope they do the right thing but you you can't control it as much so you did you obviously didn't have anything like that to deal with back uh when you were head trainer but do, do you have any uh, does any player or any injury or anything like that stand out as being some of your biggest challenges in those years? Like, like, did anybody have an injury that just never went away or um, something just really unique? Um, I have but, to be a little careful because uh, I, guess, I guess there is some privacy, but, but yeah. there's probably the two injuries that pretty much everybody knew about that I could probably talk about was um, Marky Perry dislocated his ankle before in the, the in the spring of his freshman year mm -hmm. um and his my first year there marquee and i spent a lot of time together like he he probably did th two or three hours of treatment a day just to be able to practice because he would keep losing his range of motion and um finally after his after his you know and he still had a great season i mean he was he's such a good person he's just a good human being i i I love Marquis and he's, he's an amazing basketball player. Um, the other one, the other weird injury was uh, Kevin, Kevin's hand. Um, he, this is, a, this is a, so I, he doesn't mind if I tell you this story because, so he, it was the week before we played SMS right before Christmas. He gets, he, he's going to steal a ball. The ball goes between two of his fingers and he rips the web space. He's holding his hand and he's bleeding all the way down his arm. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? He ripped the web space between his fingers. So you look down and you could see like the stuff in there. Um, and then he's like, oh, just, just sew it up. It'll be fine. I'm like, well, wait a second. Wait a second. This is your hand. Like, you... And so um, he ended up getting it sewed up. Uh, and then he's like, I got to play against SMA. I got to play against Missouri State. I got to play against Missouri State. So I was like, I was like, okay, so meet me at the gym. I think I have a way that I can protect it so that it doesn't bleed all over the place while you're playing and, and that it doesn't hurt because it was pretty sore. Like he ripped open a lot of stuff that a lot of that skin is really sensitive on your hand there. And I found a way and the reality is and it was his, it was his left hand. OK, and anybody knows that to play basketball, you need your fingertips much more than the palm of your hand. So if you've ever seen any pictures of him taped, he had a lot of tape on his hand, but he didn't have much on his fingertips. So he could do that. Plus I knew that Kevin was really ambidextrous. Like Kevin could play horse with his right hand. He was left, but he could play horse with his right hand. He was really ambidextrous. So I said, here's the deal. You've got to be kind of a, for a week or so, got to be like a right-handed point guard. You're probably going to have a hard time shooting. Um, and, uh, and, and so we, we came back and we, we beat Missouri state on a last second shot, uh, tip in by Ian Vujukas. Um, and then he, he consistently started getting better and we started weaning him off the tape and those types of things. Cause there was a little special tape job that I would do that to keep these, these fingers, it's called the check rein. He had to be able to have his fingers this far apart. You can't buddy tape them because then you can't dribble. They had to be this far apart. So there's a special tape job that I would do in between his fingers so and then we get to the end of january and he's like can i just take this tape off i don't need this tape anymore it's okay and then i talked to the doctor yeah i can take it off 30 seconds left in the game at st joe's he rips it back open uh, and i'm like it was that dude i don't know if you were on that trip or not we no, have I, the we have the team doc from st joe's sold him back up yeah and we had to play, we had to play Xavier two days later. And that was terrible. So anyway, he ended up getting better. He, we, he ended up having a great season. And then I taught him how to do that tape job himself. And he, to this day, he tells me this all the time when he played for the Australian Olympic team, when he plays pro. And if you ever see pictures of him on his left hand, he's got his, he's got his third and his fourth fingers taped together this far apart wow. he, he I taught him to do it himself yeah because he he didn't ever want to go through that again where he ripped it back open again so that was just kind of crazy um that that's that story you were asking about um yeah I, I, what's that i have uh i just it brought up he brought up a 
the, the topic that I actually f- completely <laughs> forgot about until just now. Um, and I don't even know if anybody will give a shit about this, but uh, do you remember when the ent- almost like, I think six women's players had the same mm. issue with their, sh- with the shoes. They had uh, the floor oh, yeah. at West Pine. No, it wasn't the floor. It was, oh, the it was just the shoes. The shoes. Can, yeah. you, can yeah. you, uh, can you expand on that? Cause I, so, I, that was, a that here's was what happened. So um, yeah, I mean, half of our team had stress fractures. I actually told this, I told this to my students in class because it was a, it was a, an example of looking deeper into the history of, of what goes on. So to get a stress fracture, you, you, you kind of have to use it for about three to four weeks and then the stress fracture will appear. Our women's basketball team, our women's and our men start practice in the middle of October. So what happened was, is that we, um, you know, we start practicing and all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of November, a lot of our players started getting foot pain. Um, and so we, we were trying to figure out what's going on. You know, the floor, I mean, the floor is hard, but it wasn't, it wasn't terrible hard. We had just gotten it redone recently. And, and, and then um, I was working with my friend, Mark, Mark Ryan King. He was, he was a physiotherapist, athletic trainer that did a lot of our rehab, um, especially for the people that were on the shelf, who was a post-surgicals, because we were so busy, we were so understaffed that we, we would rely on Mark to do a lot of our long rehabs, like backs and post-surgicals and stuff like that. And then, and then what he did is, is we, we took one of their team shoes and cut it down the middle. And we looked at it and there was a, because of the way the tread was on the bottom, there was a flex point in the shoe that was about a centimeter behind the ball of their foot. So there was a, the natural flex point of the shoe was actually behind that. So what we decided to do that year, and they do it to this day, is we actually have a colleague in town that's an orthotist and we get orthotics made. Um, custom orthotics made for everybody because it's it's they're cheaper than a the, we get them cheaper than a pair of shoes would cost and everyone has custom orthotics so that way the team shoe isn't that much of a factor that everyone's got a custom orthotic for their foot we did that as a response to that and um, wow. they've done side but but we had to do you know we that's the advantage of having a a teaching program in health sciences at your school you know you you think more deeply about it like you know really why is this happening why you know and you know obviously coach was very frustrated um the the administration was very frustrated we actually had meetings with our doctors and everybody where we explained why we were in this situation and we got through it um but uh but yeah that was uh you know that was one of those things where it just was the way that shoe was designed that year and no one could really anticipate it. It just was kind of a funky thing. And, and we decided from that point forward that everybody both on the men's and the women's teams would get custom orthotics every year. Hmm. And um, it's worked out really well. Yeah. It's worked. They do it to this day. Yeah. Were you there uh, to continue on the, the women's basketball kick I'm on? Were you there when they were out filming the gray seasons, the documentary? Yeah. How was I don't that? want to talk much about it. <laughs> Those guys were just everywhere. Yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I know. I, I just, it's just one of those things where I wasn't around enough to have a real educated opinion of it. Other than the yeah. fact that like, because that we would always practice back to back and then there'd always be these guys with these cameras at the women's practice, or if they'd practice after us, they'd be coming with cameras and stuff. And we were like scratching our head, like what's going on, you know, that type of thing like that. But hmm. But we were so busy. I mean, like when they were doing that, you know, I already had a, we had hired a, a women's basketball athletic trainer that was just with mm-hmm. women's basketball. She took care of that team. Um, I was really kind of taking care of volleyball and in and, uh, and men's basketball and field hockey. And then I took care of like the spirit squads and, and stuff like that. I took care of that stuff too. So one of the one of the responsibilities you you kind of touched on this earlier, but th- this is one of the things I remember most about uh, our years together is you picked all the food, you you set up all the food on road trips, yep. and I feel like every city we went to, it was like you knew the place to go. Yeah, uh, it's just what were your, what were some of your favorite places to go uh, while while we were on the road? My, my favorite places were the pizza places. So like like literally. 
Um, I would never get Domino's or Papa John's because I'm just a, you know, I'm from the looks of me, I'm like, I'm a pizza fan, right? So, <laughs> so what I would always like to do is I would always get the local pizza place. So right, right. we'd, we get, Ro- local we'd get La Rosa's Pizza in Cincinnati, Giordano's in Chicago, we'd get um, Berno's in Louisville. Um, I would always just I would always ask somebody that's from that town, like, what's what's a good local pizza place? And uh, because, you know, we ate so much pizza and stuff. And one of the things I did is is for, for efficiency, I had I had the uh, the students, uh, the guys on the team or everybody in the team pick what kind of pizza they wanted and what kind of sub they wanted. So so yeah, literally I, I had that. it on a spreadsheet <laughs> and I would put it on a fax machine. I'd send it there and every, it had everybody's names on it. And they're like, what if we want to get eat something different. Nope. Not, not with the team. You can, you can do it tomorrow when you go to subway on campus, but everybody's getting the same thing and every, everybody's getting the same thing they choose every time. So, cause I didn't want to have to like walk around to everybody's hotel room and, and say, right. do you want extra mayonnaise on that sub? Or <laughs> like, I'm like, you're going to get what you pick. You can pick at the beginning of the year. Here's the subway menu and you pick your favorite subway sub. And if we get subway subs after the game or, you know, or after practice, this is one you're going to get. And most people have a favorite, right? Most people have a favorite of those, yeah. their favorite pizza or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But we ate, those guys ate so much food. Like we, we I, were, I we put on so much fed. food when I traveled. <laughs> because so the quantity they would eat. <laughs> it was, it was, so you, you would get on the bus, you know, right? We'd be coming out of like the Bradley Center in Milwaukee. You'd get on the bus and then all of a sudden, you just see this figure walk in and there's a stack of pizza boxes like <laughs> like three feet high and on the sides you just see like bryce ian Anthony. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and we walk Everybody by boom, boom, boom. or we have in the front so when they got on the bus they would grab the one with their name on it yeah, yeah the yeah. um um the coolest coolest thing about eating was when we beat marquette on our last game in conference usa mm. on their senior night and Anthony Drea guarded Steve Novak and was locked down. And they fouled Dwayne Polk a ton down the stretch. And Dwayne came through and hit all these free throws. And Father Biondi was on the trip. And he was so happy. I've never seen Father Biondi smile so much on a trip in my life when we beat Marquette up there. And we had a big long wait because we flew commercial. We had a big long wait between. So we took the team out to the Fridays at Miller Park. There's a TGI oh. Fridays at Miller Park. We took them out there. I'm like, this will be a cool experience. Like yeah. looking out in the stadium. And it turns out it was filled with Marquette fans. And we walk in here in our royal blue travel suits. And those guys were so happy. They were ordering shakes and food and and uh, and I had to drive those Marquette fans crazy. That was that was a sweet win. That was a really, really sweet win. Yeah, yeah we held them to under 40. I was I that was one of yeah. the that was actually um the second to last game I went because that was my senior year. Yeah, and yeah, it was, yeah. It was a horrible season. We finished nine and twenty-one. Yeah. But that was uh that was a little silver lining. That actually, was, yeah. You know, we went to we went to Iowa that season too on New Year's Eve. And yeah. I wanted to ask you because, um, you know, we, we made it to Iowa a few times or played them a few yep, times. Yep, yep. But uh, was that another one where, uh, where you got to, you know, take out a bunch of people and everything? Like, Yeah, I- yeah. They come down. What we do is we would plan because the kids were older by then. Yeah. And so we actually got um, they got a big block of rooms at the same hotel we were staying at that had an indoor pool. And it was in downtown Iowa City. It was kind of fun. If you've ever been to Iowa yeah. City. They kind of have a little downtown area where all everything's at, and there's a shared. It used to be called the Sheridan. I don't know what it's called now, but but um, there's a big indoor pool and stuff. So like literally, like all my cousins and all the kids, you know, uncles were down there playing cards by the pool, and you know, I'd 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 get 15 minutes away from the team. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for coming. You know, and um, but yeah, it was really fun. And that was another thing that was really really cool. Speaking of that. My, my wife, and this is a key to work-life balance as an athletic trainer, is include your family in the fun stuff. So one of the things my wife got to do is whenever we went to good tournaments and stuff, she, we, we um, traveled, she traveled with us 
in the booster trips, she would go on every one of the booster trips. She became really good friends with Jackie McElhaga, who's Doug McElhaga's wife. Um, so that Jackie and Jackie, my wife's Jackie, um, they would do things together. And they got to know all the boosters. So like, uh, like uh, uh, the votes and all the other people that make the trips. And, and um, they end up being their own kind of group that would do stuff together while the team was busy. We went to Hawaii, we went to the Virgin Islands, we went to Las Vegas. Um, those types of things like that. So J Jackie got to enjoy that stuff. Like for example, you know, when you're when you're in third grade, you're you're the star of the week, and you get to have a guest come to class, right? In your elementary school. My older daughter Jenna, it was Drew Diener and Chris Sloan that came to class. The the my younger daughter Kaylin, uh, it was Ian Vujukas and Bryce Susak that came. You know, like they're walking around the elementary school. You know, the the desks are you know two feet high and. And they're seven foot and six ten, and they were picking the kids up, and the kids were dunking on, on the hoop in the playground, and it was it was pretty cool stuff. So like, you know, that's a real key. You know, people talk about you know how, you know that sometimes some athletic trainers don't like the schedule and stuff like that. And and um, actually, my kids were disappointed when I moved over to academics because they just loved being around athletics so much. And and um, but so I really tried to include them in all the in all the cool stuff, and then. You know, you know, the volleyball, a lot of the volleyball players would babysit our kids. So like when we went away for a weekend, one of the, the volleyball players would just stay at our house and watch the kids over the weekend and stuff like that. It worked out really well. So that, those are that, that's a little pearl of wisdom for people that are embarking on a career in athletics is let your family enjoy the good stuff. Just don't all go do it. And like, you know, call them from, you know, call them from New York City and say, hey, we're having fun in New York City. I'm like, you know, invite them, invite your wife along or or your husband along or something like that. Listening to you guys talk about team meals uh, gave me like PTSD because my fatal flaw is that I'm, I, 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 I still am a bit of a picky eater, but I was a big time picky eater up until I graduated college. And uh, the year that Ann Cordes gracious, graciously allowed me to be manager, <laughs> even though I was vastly underqualified, um, <laughs> she helped me offset some of my first semester at SLU. So Big shout out, Ann Cordes. But like, we would have like pasta meals, and I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. I'd like be eating the bread only, and everyone's looking at me and, like, you're and, the, and the rubber chicken and the and yeah. the uh, in the salad. There's, there'd always be salad there, and uh, I mean, a great story about traveling with them is because they, you know, Ann was pretty young, her staff was all young, and and then the team, and so we'd go on road trips, and I would be the only male on the trip. So I would be, you know, we'd go out for a team meal and, you know, these, these volleyball players are all like five eleven, six foot. And, and you always see them with a ponytail when they go out, they let their hair down and they usually dress nice and all that. And, and so I'd show up and every single time the waiter would bring me the check. I'm like, that for me, that woman with the red hair over there that's that's who you take it to and uh and uh that that was kind of the running gag that was really funny uh, and uh but that was such a great group i one of my fun, funniest memories is when when ann first got hired we played at indiana state and angela powers broke her ankle and then she's had to stay with us to go to a tournament at indiana bloomington and we shocked we shocked oregon state we had ida and tata Vashute, Mm -hmm. who's down at uh, Jefferson College now. She second in the nation in kills. I mean, she was an amazing player. Anyway, we go down and we just, I, I got a chance to see the energy that Ann brought and, and all that. And, um, and, and Angela had an idea to, to have the team go out and watch a movie that she heard was kind of good. Our team went out and watched Napoleon Dynamite in the movie theater. <laughs> and it was the funniest thing. <laughs> like, because no one really had made a movie like that before. And you're like, that's an interesting movie. <laughs> but I went to see it at the theater with the women's volleyball team. I remember that, yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, no, I, Anne was great. I mean, there was, there, there, Anne, I remember uh, before uh, one of the matches, I think it was Cincinnati. We were in Cincinnati and, and I, I was always just, I'm a goofy, I think, I don't even think I was a manager at this time, but uh, Mo, Mo Mangelsdorf now, but was short, oh, sure. yep. yeah, uh, was a walk-on, and uh, we were like shooting baskets with volleyballs, me and I think Kyle Walton was, was there, but uh, 
Anyway, I, I we made a bet at one point that if I made a half court shot, they had to play. Uh, Mo had to start, <laughs> and Anne Anne was like all in on this bet. She was like, "If you make it, she's starting." I was like, she, was, oh. she ended up being a pretty darn good player. Yeah, See, she, yeah. she was a pretty good player for them. The thing is, is uh, I had a really good athletic training student, um, Amelia, uh, not, not, not Amelia, uh, Trisha yeah. Jameson. Yeah. Trisha Jameson was of the team. Um, and um, with the year they won the A-10s. Um, and uh, now she went, actually, we didn't have an athletic training program at the time. So she went to South Florida um, to study athletic training. And she's been on the Texas TCU's medical staff for quite a long time and she always kind of considers herself a Billiken she she comes to our, our alumni parties at our convention and stuff like that um but but yeah I see I see Trisha every once in a while but yeah she was part of that team too I I would be absolutely remiss to uh not ask you for a story of my, my all-time favorite Billiken uh, Anthony Drea I need a Drea oh, yeah. story oh Anthony Drea, there he's he is uh, he was very unapologetic about kind of his energy he brought. So a couple different things. One of the things we used to do is we used to play. I used to have a travel Yahtzee game, and we used to play that on the road. And I still have some score sheets with like Drea, Lish, and all those things like that. The other thing those guys, him and Lish, used to cut my hair on game because those guys used to you know wear it really tight so they would always cut their hair on before a game and they're like tony are you paying for a haircut just come down when we cut our hair and I'll, we'll cut your hair for you so him and list cut my hair um but anthony drea anthony drea had um he you know the thing is about him is that he brought it there there's a, he effort was never an issue um, he always brought it against the best teams too. He brought it against Louisville. Rick Pitino hated him. He made shots like crazy. Um, I think he liked him because he was kind of a New York, New Jersey guy, but, um, but like that. So I would say my favorite memory of, of Anthony was, was, um, was, you know, hitting that shot against, against Iowa and the way he strutted down the court. I mean, that picture, I still see it to this day with him high stepping yeah. down the court um, and Chris Sloan standing on top of the scores table, whooping it up. That was pretty awesome. But yeah, Anthony just, you know, I think he would play until, until he couldn't lift his arms. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't, I mean, there were so many times where, you know, like he, he would kind of not feel well that day, but he would, he would always play. Um, that That's probably the most memorable thing about Anthony is that his effort was so, he he milked so much out of his talent um and the coaches could totally count and there's times where he would just not be on from a shooting standpoint but he would always be on defensively he would always be able to guard and those types of things like that so did you uh, travel uh, back with us do you, i don't know if you remember this but uh, the, the game i referred to earlier that was on new year's eve in 2004 um, so we were, that was a horrible year. We were nine and 21, but, um, I did not, I did okay. not make the trip back. I was going to say, because it's new year's Eve, you probably want to stay back in Iowa. With all yeah. And I came back a, a day or two later because they gave the team a couple of days off. So, Talk about new year's Eve. One of the most amazing games on new year's Eve was a double overtime game at Dayton. Yeah. Where Danny Brown hit a shot. We were losing the Dayton the whole game. Danny Brown hit a shot to put us into overtime. I think it went double overtime. And if there's if there's a louder arena than Dayton's arena, I don't know what arena it is. Like it, my ears were ringing probably for an hour and a half, sitting in the hotel room with it being quiet after the game, and all I could do is hear oh, Dayton Flyers like over the thing <laughs> because it was so loud, um, and uh, and that was a that was a memorable game uh, playing Dayton. Um, yeah. Another guy, we, remember Tom Frericks? Yeah. Well, one of the things I was going to ask you about, because he spent so more time with you than he did. Yeah. Playing, yeah. He's a, he just was a big old country boy. He's, yeah. he's, a, he's a good dude. He, he played hard, but he, I would say he's a very similar mindset to Drea, but Drea, but, but, but Tom, 
Tom couldn't sustain it, whereas Anthony yeah. could do it. Like when Tom was on a roll and he was an effort guy, he was all over the place. He'd be really, really great. But then, you know, something would happen and he'd kind of, it'd, it'd be difficult for him. He'd get hurt. One of those types mm -hmm. of things like that. Whereas um, Anthony, a lot of times would just push through that stuff. Like there's a lot of, you know, one of the things that we always say is the only injuries that people know about are the ones that happen in games. Yeah, that's right. Because that's what people see. Like if, if someone's injured in practice um, and, or if you manage it and they play all the games, half the people don't even know that those injuries happen um, because we don't tell anybody. I mean, yeah. we don't lie to anybody, but because of HIPAA, number one, we can't tell them. Um, uh, and also, you know, you don't ever want to give other people an advantage knowing somebody might be a step slower or something like that. Um, right. And then... Um, and then, you know, so that's just one of those things where you'll get asked a million questions about something that happens in a game. But, you know, we got, you know, I don't have the heart to tell the reporters that these two or three guys over here are playing a heck of a lot more hurt than this guy is. And uh, well, that, that was the kind of the story of that year, because the whole senior class, Tom and then um, Isaac uh, and Reggie Bryant, they yeah. were all kind of dealing with nagging stuff all yeah. year long. And it wasn't it, like you say; it's not the obvious stuff that was happening no. in the game. And 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 in that, I really can't talk about their conditions, but they no, were all dealing with. They were all just dealing with stuff. Pretty rare, pretty rare things um, yeah. that needed to be addressed. Um, I think the world of those guys, because they were managing some fairly challenging situations. Yeah, um, we were talking about um, Reggie Bryant and Isaac and. And, and they showed a ton of courage. I mean, they really did. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it just, you know, it just wasn't meant to happen, you know, I mean, it, and, um, and we can't control that. The other thing I, I want to say before we get up, we get done is, is it's really important for people to realize when they're watching games that, Every single, like one of the things I used to say, and, and you guys would sit next to me, those two guys sitting next to us at the end of the bench are probably the best players in the history of their school. Yeah. You know, they're, they're probably the only division one kids that come out of their school. When they go home, they get asked, how's it going? And then they got to say, well, I really never play, you know, that type of thing like that, you know, to call somebody a bum or to call somebody a, you don't realize how hard every single player works, how hard, how hard it is when you were given a full ride scholarship and you were, you were the top person, how much athletics is a part of your identity. And all of a sudden you, you're not that guy anymore. That's the reason why sometimes when I see those kids transfer to another school and be really successful, we probably have a few stories about that. I'm, I'm so happy for those kids because they ended up at the right place. Right. A lot of times, a lot of times, if you end up at a school and don't play a lot, it's because you just got caught in a numbers game. You got caught behind, you know, a really, really good player who might have took a redshirt year and is around a year longer or something like that. But the one thing I would say when people watch our teams play, number one, there's very few kids who come to a place like St. Louis University and feel entitled. They, they come here because they want to hoop. They want to they want to be they want to be a good student and they want to be a good athlete. Number two, every single one of these, every one of these kids that's wearing the jersey deserves to be there, you know, and sometimes they don't play because it's a numbers thing. Sometimes, you know, um, you know, so the thing is, is that's one thing I would say to people as they watch these games and those kind of things, you can see like, I can't believe you didn't make that shot and those types of things like that. It's like, you know, because you know, being a be, being at that level than being a dad of kind of a an athletic kid you sit in the stands with the parents and you're like you look around and they'd be yelling that why aren't they doing this i'm like do you realize that both teams are trying to win like mm -hmm. if your kid can dribble with their left hand guess what the other team is going to make them dribble with their left hand they're not going to sit there and say yeah just dribble anywhere you want with your right hand i mean they're and so that's one thing i would i would say to people is Every one of these, every one of these kids is deserves to be here. They, um, they all work really, really hard, and um, and you know, and some 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 are fortunate that they get a lot of playing time, and some don't. But 
Um, but I think there are, and, and, and actually some of the, some of my best buddies to this day are the ones that were next to me on, on the bench for most of the season. Some of the most wonderful memories they're, they keep in touch with me to this day. It's pretty amazing stuff. So, um, that'd be, that'd be one of my little pearls that I want to throw out. Did, did you get to see Jason Tatum running around a little bit when he was, yeah, in? he was, he was, yeah, he was, I mean, he was, a he was, a he's he, he was he was we had these open practices so like literally <laughs> there would be kids up in the stands and all that kind of stuff like that i mean i i probably um i probably knew him more through like the nike elite 100 camps and stuff because he would be coming through them as a pretty young age i mean he was um everybody knew he was going to be really good so and then and i took care of justin quite a bit his freshman year my my first year which was his what if, you worked a lot of those events, right? Like the Nike events and didn't you yeah. do some like NCAA and Valley tournament? Yeah. Stuff so, and- so what happens is what happened was, is as I was getting done in 2007, the sports commission in the Missouri Valley conference was looking for um, a new medical staff to, to help be the host sports medicine. And they were hosting a sweet 16 that year. And so, you know, and I just brought my mindset from what I would need as the head athletic trainer at SLU when I went to an event. So I wanted to, I included my students. I put students behind their bench so they could help them keep their water bottles filled. They could help them do all, all the stuff that when you're traveling in a limited travel party to have somebody helping you with like cleaning up after someone's bleeding and to have somebody there. So I really made it an experience for our students and, and I, and I wanted to tell the Missouri Valley and the sports commission and say, Hey, you know what? I don't want you to have to worry about this. Just know that we got it. And they keep asking us back. Like, so literally, you know, women's final four, several sweet 16s, every, every time there's something there are, you know, not, and we do all the Missouri Valley tournaments. Um, it's a great experience for our students because they get the network. They get to meet a lot of different athletic trainers. They get to see how people interact with their teams Um, and the only reason we do it is because, uh, because our students get to do it. You know, we, we volunteer our time, but it creates an opportunity for our students to, you know, do this networking, to get, to get a glimpse of how these big, big events work. Um, but we've, you know, you know, being at a, being at a basketball game in the dome is pretty cool stuff. You know, (laughs) um, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm, you know, there's a lot of these things that I've kind of fallen into over my life. And, and it's like, yeah, that was cool. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think, and, but part of it is that you get invited back because you do a good job. So like same thing with the Nike elite 100 camp we've done. a. What I love about that camp is that I, it's kind of a rite of passage for our students. So between their first and second year is they get the, that's really a tradition in our program that our students get to work at that and they get to work with these guys who are going to be in the NBA in two or three years, you know, you know, Anthony Davis and, and, you know, Jordan, Jordan's kids were there. Michael Jordan was there, yeah. you know, Tim Hardaway Jr. was there, all those people like that. And then all these guys that are playing now, they were all in, in the Elite 100 camp. But, but what we do is because we're faculty that are there, we let our students do a lot. So like literally they do all the taping. They're the first ones to evaluate an injury on the court. And then we supervise it it's a really good developmental experience for our students, which is, which is, you know, Hey, we're at a teaching institution. We, we need to do it that way. And so it's a great way for them to work with some of the highest level athletes in the country and to actually make decisions, which, which is really important for them to, for their development. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the Yahtzee score sheets. Uh, is there a, is there a piece of memorabilia you kind of, a, a, kind of gathered over the year that is your favorite or. Okay. Look at this. And Peter re- recognizes this picture. That is that is my very first year. That's the game against Cincinnati. That hung in the basketball office yeah. until they moved out of West Pine Gym. And they had all the pictures stacked up. And they were going to do not they weren't going to do anything with them. So I'm like, I'll take that. So <laughs> um, so yeah. You know what? All you remember all those pictures that were in the hallways yeah. of all the different athletes on every team? You know where those are all at? They're hanging in the dining hall in Reinhardt. What? So you go into Reinhardt, you have Justin Johnson's picture hanging up. 
forget the Netflix documentary. We're we're staging a heist, Peter. Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, seriously, you would know every single person on the wall in the Reiner dining hall because they were all the ones that were in there from the early two thousands. Every sport, cross country, baseball, basketball. You got to go do a recon mission. Yeah, yeah, we're we'll get on that. <laughs> We're definitely yeah. do a live yeah. remote once COVID's over. You want to do a live remote from the Reiner dining hall? Oh, I, nice. I had a uh, I have the uh, the Miracle in Memphis banner hanging. I had it in my basement. I bought it for like ten bucks when they closed uh, or when they moved over to Shafer. Give me one second. All right. I'm waiting with bated breath. Oh, wow. wow. That's so, awesome. He's holding up, for those listening, he's holding up that, a... I made that um, out of one of the signs that hung on the... That hung on the... Uh, the street uh, posts? The street posts, yep. Yeah. So I took the vinyl and I wrapped it around and stapled it on. And then I also have a chair from the... I also have a chair from the... Um, from the... Uh, uh, women's Final Four bench. I have one of the chairs. I got that when we were at the Women's Final Four. So I that in my office. I, I got a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of a I'm kind of a sucker for that kind of stuff. I love it. I love yeah, it. I, yeah, yeah. I, quit, I got a whole I, closet full. I got a whole closet full of travel suits that I never want to give away because I don't want to just I don't want to give stuff with Slew's logos on to like Goodwill and nothing against Goodwill. Goodwill does great work and stuff like that. I just take a lot of pride in having this on my chest and I just don't want to just, you know, I, I would rather leave it in a closet than, than, uh, than, uh, uh, than give it, than, you know, throw it in a hamper someplace or something. Yeah. Well, Tony, I can't, I can't thank you enough, man. This yeah. was, this was a, a, the, this was a great hour and 40 minutes. It was, I mean, we could, I, we could go on forever, but I don't want to keep you up at, keep you any longer. Um, yeah. But, thanks for the invite. Yeah. I mean, you're welcome on any time. I'm sure you got more. We can, uh, <laughs> we can go. Over. Yeah, I know. I, I would, you know what? I'd love to get on here with some of the guys. So like, if you ever bring yeah. some of the guys on, yeah. I would love it. Like if, you know, I, you got to get Diener and Sloan to do it. We're, you we're gotta, oh yeah. my God. I had Sloan. We we talked to Sloan on the the previous iteration of the podcast, and it's a, it was amazing. He you he got to have Diener and Sloan together. Yeah. Okay, because That's what they'll we just they'll just you will you will cry. They have such a dynamic between the two of them. They will just cry laughing Diener, because they're just so inherently funny. Those two. Diener was the funniest player of anyone from my years at SLU for sure. I, I, I would definitely give it to him. Okay, I've got one more story I'm going to tell you. We we got out and we got and play at Arizona, and Drew Diener hurt his back at St. Bonaventure, and we were treating him. You, did you go on that trip to Arizona? I didn't make this one. Yeah, no. you didn't, yeah, it was pretty. It was a really long road trip. We went from St. Bonaventure to Tucson, and we had to play Lute Olson and everything at Arizona. I think anyway, actually that was the year after I graduated. But. Anyway, we were in we were in one of these embassy suites. So like you had that, the, the courtyard and then you had all of the walkways around and, and I was doing some treatments in, 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 uh, for Diener and then Sloan was in hanging out with us in there watching TV or something like that. I was doing it. And we come out and stand by that. We, 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 we come out and stand by the railing and, and I don't know if you knew Ross Varner. I mean, Ross Varner was a Renaissance man. I mean, he played musical instruments. He had a beautiful singing voice. He, he just was very intelligent. He was Mormon. He went on a Mormon mission. He played for Lorenzo at Pepperdine. And he spoke he, four languages. Yeah. He, you know, he'd hear people ru- talking Russian in the airport and he'd stop them and just talk Russian mm-hmm. with them because he did yeah. his Mormon mission in Russia. Anyway, one of his Pepperdine teammates, who was also Mormon, married, um, uh, uh, married his high school sweetheart and his high school sweetheart's sister came to our game and 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 he's down there playing the piano and singing to her and I like look at this and I'm like I'm like Drew Chris what do you want to bet they're married within a year and they were and they've had a ton of kids. I mean, they just uh they just that it's it's you know I mean that's just the way that's just the way 
Ross was cut, but he's super guy, awesome guy. Um, and his, uh, his, uh, his family sang the national anthem at a game and he hit the last second shot to win it. I remember, who I think it was Washington or something. Washington. He beat it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, there's just all kinds of stuff like that, but, uh, um, but, but Drew and Drew and Chris would be a great two to have on here. Um, you know, I think if you could, you know, if you could get, uh, you know, if you could get more, um, I'm just trying to think other kind of duos, uh, possibly Kevin and Luke Meyer might be a good combo to put oh, on no. together. Those two, those two were kind of joined at the hip. Anybody with Anthony Drea would be fine. Um, Marky Perry and Fish would be would be good, but you would have to probably. Yeah. You know, once or, you get them talking, they'll be great, but they'll probably won't Fish be. And, uh, Kevin Shortle, they those for whatever reason those two used to. Get yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know for sure. I, I um, remember when uh, or no, that's right. That was Ian Mooney. Like just I'm watching the final four and randomly Ian Mooney shows up on the bench. I'm like, Mooney, for Mooney Texas. Had the best. we've got to get him on sometime. He had the oh, best. Oh, he's four. great. Oh yeah. my God. He's like, yeah, he is absolutely. Uh, he is absolutely one of those Forrest Gump type of characters. Yeah. Gifted storyteller. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you can put the players together, like in twos, that's great. Cause then you can get them playing off each other. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Great, great um, talking to you guys. Yeah, yeah thanks, Tony. Awesome. This uh, this brought me uh, this brought back a lot of memories. <laughs> yeah, I hope I didn't divulge too much. I hope I didn't, uh, no one's too upset at me. But no, but, not uh, at all. But yeah, yeah. But great seeing you all, and hopefully we'll all see each other. And um, in uh, we'll share Memphis share Arena. a beer at that new open area place. Yeah, what what that'd be wonderful. That'd be great. I would I would absolutely look forward to that. So. Go Billikens and um, and reach out anytime. Happy to be a part of it. Awesome. Thanks again. Oh, good. Thanks a lot. Take care. See y'all.